Welcome back to the series where I analyze the characters of Persona 3 under the lens of the tarot archetypes and the fool's journey. Since this is part 2 of a multiple part series, you may consider watching part 1, which I will link in the description, before watching this video. I explain Carl Jung's general ideas regarding the tarot archetypes and related concepts in the first few minutes of part 1 if you're curious about those things specifically, but otherwise, let's jump right into part 2 of the character analyses. So, have you been waiting for this? My terrible attempt at humor aside, the fourth archetype that the fool encounters on his journey is the Emperor, or otherwise known as our star in the ring, Akihiko Sanada. The Emperor is the archetypal fatherly role in the tarot and in brief words, teaches the fool about power, leadership, and overcoming adversity. On one hand, the upright emperor is known for providing structure and discipline that allows him to be assertive and gain the strength necessary to achieve what he desires. A rather obvious example of this is Akihiko's constant need to train and practice for both battles in Tartarus and for his boxing matches. He's so into training that Junpei basically calls him out on it when they first arrive to the beach in Yakushima. Akihiko also provides some valuable structure to the group through his texts and calls to the MC about the next step forward for C's throughout the game. Plus, he showcases his assertiveness by basically being the one guy who's responsible for the majority of new member additions to C's. Akihiko does all these things to assist in his quest to become stronger, explore Tartarus, and later on, destroy the Dark Hour. Which leads us to the topic of the Emperor's tendency for one-track mindedness and impatience. Since Akihiko obsesses so much over becoming stronger and fighting, he sort of struggles in finding time to develop other skills, especially more social ones. His timidity and struggle to speak about anything that isn't related to physical training in some form becomes apparent in Operation Babe Hunt, his first time talking to Aegis, and in the bonus secret recording of him in his room. I think now is also an opportunity to bring up some of the contrasts Akihiko, who is the emperor and firm fatherly figure of the tarot, plays to Mitsuru, the empress and motherly archetype. While Mitsuru takes the time to nurture the younger members of Seas through her words, Akihiko is focused more on the practical needs of an operation and is very straight to the point. One such example is during the Fuka rescue mission where he butts in saying there is no time to waste when Mitsuru compliments Junpei on a job well done. And just as a heads up, more on the contrast between the two senpais is in the part 1 video of this series under the Mitsuru section. Now, going back to Akihiko though, his inflexible mindset and impatience leads into the main aspects of the reverse emperor, which represents two sides of the same coin in this case. On one hand, a strong desire to control his surrounding environment, and on the other, a feeling of personal helplessness in a situation. Akihiko's obsession over developing his physical strength stems from his feelings of powerlessness in being unable to save his sister many years ago. I mean, of course strength is required to protect people from shadows, but this assertiveness can also come across as too pushy and can rub others, especially those closest to him, the wrong way. Mitsuru's frustration with this side of him is showcased in various points in the story. Plus, he definitely seems to push Shinji away more and more on a personal level with his continual insistence on having him rejoin Seas. Akihiko's impatience and pushiness in this matter can be argued to be an indirect cause of the latter's premature death at the hands of Takaya even if Shinji is ultimately responsible for his own decision to rejoin after Akihiko tells him about Ken. But he eventually does learn from his mistakes. Akihiko overcomes the negative tendencies of the Emperor archetype, going from extreme assertiveness to the more passive encouragement that is found from the most respected fatherly figures. 
This is particularly highlighted in his interactions with Ken after the passing of Shinji, especially in Ken's ultimate Persona Awakening scene and the talk they have together in December regarding their decision about Roji's offer. Akihiko no longer asserts what he thinks might be best for Ken, but instead encourages him to draw on his own strength to reach his own personal decision. Plus, in Akihiko's own Persona resolution scene, he overcomes his unhealthy obsession with pure strength. His lines and actions throughout the rest of the game showcase his constant triumph over adversity without his previous focus solely on power. So, in conclusion, the Emperor teaches the Fool valuable lessons on the strength that's necessary for effective leadership while still avoiding becoming too controlling or authoritarian over others. Following the Emperor is the Hierophant. Though he doesn't stick with us for long, Shinji Aragaki definitely makes his mark on the plot as the representative of this archetype. But first of all, what exactly is a hierophant? Well, this term refers to a well-respected holy figure who offers guidance on society's moral or spiritual matters. It stems from ancient Greek with tahiera meaning the holy and phenein meaning to show. And I hope I pronounce those right. So the Hierophant Tarot, on the most basic level, is meant to teach the Fool the value of seeking out guidance for these matters. The Upright Hierophant is a compassionate figure who comes to the Fool's aid and offers guidance when he can't reach the needed answers by himself. Shinji offers this in spades to both Seas and Strega. First off, on Strega's side, Jin knows to go to Shinji for valuable intel on Caesar's motivation and overall end goal. And not to mention, he's there to save Chidori when her persona is about to kill her in the hospital. Now on Caesar's side, Shinji is there to help out Yukari, Junpei, and MC when they make the unwise decision of venturing into the sketchy part of Tatsumi Port Island. And not only does he save them, but he also enlightens them to the real nature behind the ghost story aspect behind Fuka's disappearance. Shinji also consistently tries to warn Akihiko about his obsession with power. This is shown in one such example on June 23rd where he tells Akihiko that he's no different than himself, focusing too much on the past. As for Seas as a whole, he offers guidance about the nature of Strega's personas on September 10th when he saves Chidori. Now I'd like to go into the ways that Shinji showcases the reverse of this archetype. Now, the reverse Hierophant can find himself suffocated by rigid social and moral order. Shinji just can't let go of what had happened in the past, the fact that his persona killed an innocent person. While this event is tragic, it was not Shinji's intent to kill Ken's mom. It was out of his control, and yet he cannot stop blaming himself for what is understandably despicable in society's eyes, the murder of another individual. But what Shinji says to Akihiko reveals just how far he has resigned himself to society's morals. His refusal to let go of his guilt leads him to begin self-sabotaging by taking the same fatal pills that Strega takes. And what's more, this shows his refusal to seek guidance and help from others for himself. His inability to realize the upright Hierophant culminates in the heated confrontation Akihiko initiates with him after the instance with Chidori in the hospital. Shinji reveals just how adamant he is to go at it on his own without troubling anyone in seas. And in my opinion, the ultimate tragedy of this character is that he is fully self-aware of all the harm he's doing to himself, but he continues along this path until it leads to his demise. Though this is incredibly unfortunate, Shinji's final moments really act as a core guiding light for both Ken and Akihiko. 
since the Hierophant archetype is also symbolic of a figure who is farther along the path as the person seeking guidance, Shinji's final words to Ken and the finality of his death acts as a major driving force behind the resolution both need to evolve their ultimate personas and to develop the strength behind wanting to pursue life and challenge Nyx. So, in conclusion, the Hierophant teaches the Fool that it is okay to reach out to others when in need, and to seek the guidance of a wiser role model when at a loss of how to proceed. The last archetype in this video, and the sixth overall that the Fool encounters, is the Lovers, or Yukari Takaba in P3. The Lover's Tarot is quite nuanced, and a bit more so than some of the other archetypes in my opinion, but I think in the most relatable terms, the Lover's teaches the Fool that each major decision he makes either brings him closer or farther from his own self-awareness, and also to be mindful of what kinds of relationships and values he wishes to invite into his life. On one hand, the Upright Lovers is symbolic of the fulfilling relationship one enjoys with a close lover or soulmate. As you can tell, this often is in reference to a romantic relationship, but it can also generally refer to a close relationship with another individual. These ideas translate to the lover figure skill in developing close relationships with others when she puts her mind to it. So, although Yukari spends a vast amount of the early part of the game purposefully keeping personal distance between herself and the other C's members, there are many instances in which you can tell she craves more. For example, when the MC wakes up in the hospital after his first persona awakening, she shares about her dad and how she'd wanted to talk about that with someone else for a very long time. During the third full moon operation, she attempts to make conversation with Mitsuru, despite her misgivings about her, when the two of them are alone together. And she also plays an important role in reassuring Fuka that they are friends, which is revealed in Fuka's social link with the MC. Adding on to that, the Upright Lovers is also symbolic of creating and staying true to a very internalized system of beliefs. This is most prominently seen in her overcoming her doubts and fears about the nature of her father's research, but in order to elaborate more on this aspect, I'd like to transition into the reverse lover's analysis for Yukari's particular case. For a large part of the game, Yukari struggles with fully trusting her inner belief system of valuing close friendships and trusting others. Just as I brought up previously, you can tell that Yukari wishes to develop close relationships with other people, but she deliberately distances herself due to the hurt that she has experienced before of losing her close relationships, mostly due to the death of her dad and her shaky relations with her mom. Her tendency to lash out at people like her mom, Mitsuru, and other C's members reflects an additional aspect of the reverse lovers which tends to blame others for difficult situations instead of taking individual responsibility. Yukari is quite abrasive in multiple instances that are actually due to her own misunderstandings, such as blaming Mitsuru for hiding the truth and pitying her, blaming the MC for thinking her weak, and blaming her mom for not caring about her late father's feelings. Her tendency to do this is a double-edged sword that hurts both the people she blames and her desire to develop closer relationships. In turn, this results in her struggle to adhere fully to her inner belief system of trust and friends that she refers to in a monologue on July 12th. However, Yukari learns to realize when the fault lies with her over the course of the game. She is the first one to apologize for her behavior on multiple instances to Mitsuru, the MC, and even her mom as shown in her social link. 
Her initially shaky relationships mend and end up becoming incredibly close, as seen with Mitsuru, for example. And finally, though she did have her doubts in some instances, the fact that she held true to her internalized belief systems paid off since she was right to believe in her father and the true nature of his research, despite the initial deception by Ikutsuki. And her faith in trusting others paid off in all the friendships she was able to make with C's members. So, in conclusion, the lover's archetype teaches the fool to evaluate how he wishes to engage in his relationships and the value of developing an individuali individualized system of beliefs. And with that, thanks so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please like, comment, and consider subscribing for the next part in this series. I will be covering, I guess, the chariot, Koromaru, the strength tarot, and Jin Shirato from Strega as the hermit next. So until next time, take care, see ya!